Welcome, everyone, uh, to this uh, bi-weekly General SharePoint Development uh, Special Interest Group. This um, is our bi weekly meeting focused on, on SharePoint development, uh, see some uh, core stuff, uh, PowerShell, kind of uh, everything except typically uh, JavaScript and SharePoint framework. Um, on our agenda today, we have our recurring topics. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, what's new in PNP System Core and PowerShell in modernization. Uh, Chris Kent is again there for like a, a cool demo. I don't know what topic it is. Uh, it seems to be something with horses. We'll see. Uh, then we have Paolo uh, talking about the provisioning portal or provisioning service. So I hope you've all tried that uh, before. Like uh, it's super easy. You go there, log in and pick a template and boom, the template appears in your, um, in your tenant. Now, how does it work behind the scenes? That's uh, Paolo's talk. And Valen uh, also has a recurring topic, uh, and we'll talk this, talk this time about uh, SharePoint Framework unit tests uh, and code coverage. And hopefully there's some time for Q&A. Let's see how fast we go. Maybe it goes faster if I'm talking uh, compared to Vesta. What's this? Uh, Microsoft Teams. So this is us just saying we've heard about Teams, and we will switch to it as soon as we can. Uh, once, once it right. supports the okay. meeting issue, once uh, it supports the meeting uh, features we need and the ability to manage the calls and the way we've been managing the calls with the different uh, presenters and, and those sorts of things. So that's what this slide's all about. All right. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, yep. Team I presenting. Was, I was looking for teams in SPFX, and that is this the wrong call. No, it is not. Okay, <laughs> good. But yeah, eventually we'll we'll switch to teams, but uh, it has to be uh, stable and mature for this type of, of uh, uh, big audience. As always, um, uh, we would love to, um, to work with you. Would love your participation in the community. Um, different ways to do that. Uh, uh, one way uh, to, to get, uh, you can get a forum here in this call if you build something cool that you want to show, uh, a particular pattern that you used, uh, just something, uh, a, a cool script, a PNP PowerShell, uh, using modernization to do some uh, nice projects, meaning just reach out to us uh, and you, you get like uh, your 50 minutes of fame where you can just show what you did and explain to, to the audience uh, how it worked and, uh, and your lessons learned. So think. come on, Bert. That sounds so bad. Fifteen minutes of fame. It's 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 a it's, great opportunity to show. It's the the thirty stuff. minutes of fame. Uh, no, no, no. What I mean is, it's not just <laughs> fifteen minutes of fame and then it's done. No, no, no. no, no, no it's no, great no. opportunity to get uh, visible on the community. So that's what I mean with that. And it Sorry. will live on forever in the recordings. Yes. That is true. That is true. Exactly. Sorry. Uh, sorry for my delay. Um, I jumped to another computer because one of the computers went. Uh, I don't know. One. Um, but uh, Bert, if you don't mind, I'll I'll take it over uh, for now, and we'll get to you on the status. So, alrighty. Excellent. And recording, by the way, is working for me as well, so that's good. We do need to do some stitching on the start. Sorry for that. Some technical issues. Um, but again, um, uh, let us know if you're looking into doing a, a uh, demos or if you want to do a demo. Uh, this time we have three demos. Quite often we have two. We want to keep the, the sessions relatively open so there would be time for Q&A. Uh, we've been, though, having quite a few requests uh, for demo spots lately, and that has meant that in the SPFX calls we actually quite often have three demos nowadays, but we'll keep it, uh, keep it max three, uh, hopefully two per a session. Now, contribute also on GitHub, uh, provide feedback as well. Now, uh, let's see if I can actually get, yes, uh, just a reminder on so the URLs, <coughs> quickly, AKMSSP Dev Docs, our documentation, AKMSSP Dev Videos, that's where the, all of the recordings, everything else uh, is available, uh, typically 24 hours after the sessions, and then SharePoint Dev Issues, AKMSSP Dev Issue List. So if you're running into any technical issues related on SharePoint in on-prem or in SharePoint Online, uh, let us know. Uh, it's, it's actually better to add an entry on the issue list and then ping us, for example, me in a social media, rather than wait for me to respond in a social media and then ask you to, to open the issue. There's multiple other people uh, on uh, addressing these things. Now, there are, uh, there are a few uh, le new findings on the, on the critical issues which we're currently working on, uh, which have been reported uh, as late as today. On the 20, uh, 1.8 memory issue, and we're working on that one as well. Right now, we would recommend actually to use TypeScript 2.7 and uh, Office UI Fabric 5 is, if possible, uh, to avoid the memory issue uh, with the latest version. Now, um, a few kind of numbers uh, from March, because we got these finally yesterday. Uh, so, 
Uh, weekly, we had 220,000 uh, YouTube watch time minutes, which is cool. Uh, so there's quite a lot of demo videos and content there. Uh, we had 37,000 views in YouTube, which is really cool. Uh, GitHub uh, had 57,000 unique visitors, which is uh, insane, a big number. It is growing rapidly as well, and 28,000, uh, two, sorry, 283,000 views in GitHub. Uh, on desktop Microsoft, on SharePoint DevDocs, we had 1.2 million views, which is really cool as well, and that's growing rapidly as well. So people are finding. Uh, the ways of the document documentation, uh, which actually is in a relatively good shape for all of the modern capabilities. Now, reusable components, uh, 22,000 unique tenants were using those within the past month. These are the BMP reusable open source components. Uh, they, they generated more than 15 billion HTTP requests, and the most used capability was the provisioning engine, uh, again, uh, with more than or almost 3,500 uh, tenants using that uh, within the past month. So pretty impressive. So 15 uh, billion, do we need to then optimize our code, or is it just... Yeah. Yeah, 15 billion HTTP requests. Maybe we should optimize some of the code, and that's true as well. There's always room for optimization. That is a fair point uh, as well, um, because obviously the, the amount of requests isn't the key point. What we want to actually metric is that's not, not an objective, uh, but okay, um, that was just a factual thing. Right, Bert? Were you trying to say something else? No, okay, you went uh, no, You're right, totally right. I think that the <laughs> amount of tenants keeps on growing, and I think that this uh, a more important metric, actually. Correct. Correct. Almost Absolutely. 23k yeah. tenants, so that's amazing. Now, um, let's jump to the PMP some core and uh, PMP PowerShell and uh, modernization updates, and then we go to the demos after that. But, uh, Bert, I think you'll do this section. Yeah, if you can move to the next one. Uh, absolutely. All righty. See some core. Um, we are really close to our release moment. Actually, that will be tomorrow for PNP System Core, so the, for the April uh, release. Uh, some key uh, improvements. Uh, I think uh, one of the big ones is the one done by Yannick, uh, um, which enables exporting and importing uh, client-side pages which have dynamic data connections. So if you connected your web parts together and you export the page, uh, you can kind of reapply the same page with those connections again uh, on another page. So really cool uh, improvement uh, from Yannick. Gotham did uh, improvements uh, in our handling of CDNs. Actually, I think there was even a bug like that where we kind of treated private CDNs like uh, public CDNs. So that's fixed. We have a sync to Teams method, uh, which is, is mainly there to support uh, the PowerShell commandlet uh, for it. But essentially, uh, it syncs your application, your app, shipment framework uh, package from uh, the app catalog uh, to the Teams uh, uh, store. There is also um, a bug fix. Oh, kind of actually, a sorry, Bert, on that one, yeah. just to clarify, the, the really the scenario for that one is to be able to do automatic deployment of the Teams tabs using APIs, right? So you can actually automate the whole flow, for example, in uh, Visual Studio DevOps. So, Yes. Um, we have an update for repost page. So repost is a particular uh, modern page content type where you can kind of create a new page which points to uh, an article on the web and then the SharePoint kind of picks an image and, and the text and then has like a nice news page for it, which looks the same as a, a regular news page. Now, if you would try to uh, kind of uh, read that page and save it again using our page API, it would kind of, it would break essentially and that's been fixed. And there were several bug fixes from uh, multiple people uh, uh, this month as well. So uh, I listed the, the handles there. Um, what's in progress? Um, the page templates, our uh, new schema. Actually, Paolo is about to press the submit button for that one. So after we push out this release on Friday, uh, we'll push in the new schema and start working on that with a goal, kind of an aim, I would say, to, to get it uh, most of it implemented for the May uh, release. So that's really, it's coming now. We promised it a few times, but now it's really coming. Uh, so that's good. Can you move to the next slide, Vesa? Well, we, we should address the completely meaningless fact, uh, because that was called. Oh, ah, yeah, but there was meaningless last two weeks ago as well. That is true. <laughs> Situation <laughs> so, has changed. It stays meaningless. Uh, it's still Tuesday. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's, it's Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Monday, Friday. So just letting everybody know. Super, super important thing. So. So Let's move to BMP PowerShell. I think. Change that metric. <laughs> <laughs> Irving, I think you're on a call as well. <laughs> yep, I am. 
So just like uh, Bert, we're releasing tomorrow. And, and w while you scan the page, you might notice that actually PNP PowerShell also has a very meaningless fact, and it's also the most used on Tuesdays, apparently. <laughs> Funnily enough, maybe the two are related. Um, so what Bert already mentioned, um, there is this uh, ALM method to sync um, an app from the app catalog into the Teams app catalog um, that was mainly built for the PowerShell command let's sync PNP apps to Teams or app to Teams, which allows you, as, as I said, like using DevOps, fully automate your process there. Um, then, actually, Bert um, wrote yeah, some... Yeah, let, uh, let me take this one. Uh, yeah. yeah, so uh, I've added a commandlet to export PNP clients at page mapping, which uh, is a commandlet that you can use as part of the, the publishing page support for page transformation. So you can really now uh, start to take your publishing pages and build modern pages from that. That does require to have um, a mapping, kind of a, a page layout based mapping. For each page layout, there is like a model that describes how this page layout kind of gets translated into a modern page. And this commandlet uh, allows you to uh, kind of export the default mappings that's inside the, the product. It also allows you to um, analyze your existing uh, publishing portal and it will pick up all the page layouts and, and just kind of analyze them and put them in a mapping file. So that's a nice announcement there. Um, yep. Around the convert to PNP client side pages, so that's the commandlet that you use to uh, take a classic page, uh, wiki web part or publishing page, um, and generate a modern version of that one. So we talked about publishing page support already. Um, furthermore, there is um, support for pages which live outside of the site pages library. Um, typical examples is, is, is web part pages that people put inside assets, for example. Uh, pages can also live in folders now. If subfolders being used, we, we, we respect the folder structure, and that works nice. And there is like a pretty extensive, uh, well-built uh, logging system as well. Um, so you can generate MD-based logs either on file or as a page in SharePoint. Uh, so we use the MD Viewer web part to actually show the log as a nice page in SharePoint. Pretty cool. Yeah, indeed. So to continue the last bullet there, so now for some reason over the years, we the set PNP view command that has been there for a long time already, but for some reason we completely missed the, the ability to set view fields on a view. I don't know where, why we missed that, but uh, it's there now, so now set PNP view allows you to set the fields on the view. Um, there are more comments coming. Uh, obviously every month we, we increase, we're over 390, probably towards 400 right now already. Um, it's growing. Um, still looking for people that help, want to help us writing unit tests. That is a very important thing, and we really need to focus on that to get unit tests in place. So, uh, and I see here in the stats that we're at 11,000 tenants already per month that use PNP PowerShell, which is a crazy number. So. I just want to, if I can, can I have a side note that I want to make because we ran something today into an, an, an issue with the PIN provisioning engine and f um, so a gap in the provisioning engine. Um, and the weird part is that Chris, who will become a bit later with a demo, actually demoed functionality in December of last year where he had it working, but it couldn't work. It can't, it couldn't have worked. It's impossible what he demoed that worked, but he still, he, there is video proof of it, <laughs> that he made it work. That's fake, it, it, fake it, news, fake news. It, it, he's a magician, so <laughs> stay on and watch his presentation because the guy is a magician. He does really cool things, so just wanted to say that. All righty. Uh, if I can you please move. Yeah, thank you. So, last slide, uh, modernization tooling. Uh, as mentioned, publishing page support in preview. Um, what I would love for you guys to, to do is give it a try. Just uh, take some real-world portals that you have, uh, and you can use the, the tech to uh, take the publishing pages in that portal and generate modern pages in a new site. So publishing page transformation always goes to a, a new communication site. So the old page from the old portal will be a nice modern page in, the, in your communication site. So you can kind of safely try it. The old portal will completely stay unharmed, but I would love to get some testing coverage uh, and feedback uh, on that one. Um, as mentioned, uh, already there is like this uh, MD-based log file generation done by uh, Paul Bullock, um, so really cool addition to uh, transformation technology. 
we talked about page libraries, about pages outside of the library, uh, and there are some improvements in HTML transformation. Um, we kind of better respect what SharePoint actually supports, so we don't give you page, uh, tables with a column row span or with um, nested tables anymore. Then uh, there's a recurring topic that we didn't do actually any work on for the last two months, three months, two months, is that's the page transformation UI, um, and actually, I'm, to be blunt, uh, we'll, we'll postpone further efforts there to do a May time frame, just from a resource perspective, there's no time for doing that for now. And looking at the right side, I don't have a funny fact, so we should add that one for the next the time, but the, uh, usage is growing as well. Um, so overall modernization, the, the modernization framework uh, <coughs> and the modernization scanner, uh, everything is, is, is getting more and more adopted. So a nice uh, upward trend. Excellent. Let's actually move forward. Uh, we're slightly behind of the schedule, but I think it should be fine, and that's mainly because of m me having a technical issues this morning, so or afternoon. But Chris, I think you're up next on the queue related on your biweekly view formatting tip. Yep. Let me just share the screen here. Absolutely. Loading from me. And here we go. All right, good. I was just having some fancy word art. All right, so uh, this is me. I'm Chris Kent, uh, development MVP, core team, all that stuff. Okay. All right, let's start started on some cool stuff. So, oh, also I'm magical, by the way. So, it's very important. Uh, I believe it is because Paolo and I touched David Copperfield's hand. It's, uh, it's truly a magical moment for both of us. All right. So a couple weeks ago, I showed you some stuff on how to use, like, uh, index of as a function to do some contains, right, so we could see when, when we were inside a multi-select person column, right? <laughs> it's too much info. I agree. All right, so and then we also did some stuff here. We did multi-choice icons, right? So we gave you some cool tips on how to use the index of to do a contains or starts with, and that's all cool. But what if we want to go a little further? Let's make that so I can actually see it. There we go. All right. Now I can switch my tabs. Okay. So what if we had to do something where we don't just want to know ahead of time what they got, right? Uh, like in a person column, right, you could have, you know, 100,000 people in your organization. You can't prepare, you know, a special icon for each one of those. So we want to be able to do something cool, right? So let's say I've got, for example, I've got this very exciting choice column here. It just got letters as my choices. It's, it's a multi-choice column. Uh, hopefully, you'll catch up here in a second. If it doesn't catch up, just, uh, you know, uh, be, be sad and cry. Okay. Or, you know, rejoin, whatever you're going to do. Okay, so we come in here, and I'm going to go ahead and column say I'm going to format this column. All right, there we go. We can see that. I'm just going to take a very basic format. I'm going to paste that in there. And all this is going to do, if we take a look at it, it's just going to draw a div and put an A, and it's going to make some pretty squares. So I made a single square, and that's okay, right? Now, what if we want to actually draw an element, right, or even a complex element that's got multiple children, and we want to do lots of conditions per choice? Well, luckily, we can do exactly that uh, with the new for each property. So the cool thing is, here on our child property, we can come in here, and we can have this for each, which is brand new. As an FYI, it is not in the schema, so if you're using something like VS Code, uh, expect it to get flagged. But trust me, it's working. It's magical. All right. Now, the cool thing is we come in here and we can type in our virtual field name, which I'll come back to explain that in a second, in at current field, right? So what this is going to do is this is actually going to convert this element here into a template element. So now it will now create one, one element that this is nested in for every item in our array, in this case, every selected choice. Now, this choice iterator, you can name this whatever you want. So I'm saying best practice is to add the word iterator and either use the column type or the column name because you can clobber over things because you're creating a virtual field. Let's see what that looks like. Oh, we got to add a comma. All right, let's preview that. Ooh, look at that. Now we suddenly get a new element for every one of our choices there. And we can actually take advantage of those values. Now, I mentioned the idea of a virtual field. So our choice iterator became a virtual field. I'm going to copy that. So where I'm referencing things, say in the text content, instead of A, I can reference just like any other field syntax, right? My choice iterator is now a field. I can do the same thing over here in the tool tip, right? There, now when I preview that, boom! Now we suddenly get those values, right? And we can start to see that everything gets pretty cool there. 
So you know, if, if we wanted to do something a little crazier where we come in here and we start editing stuff, we can. So we want to add, you know, additional things. We can access everything else just like we normally do. All right, so it's PG color. All right, we'll say, yep. uh, we'll say our choice iterator again. So we're just going to access that, and we're going to say maybe it's not equal to C. That sounds good. All right, let's do the theme primary. You know, otherwise, let's do yellow for our color. All right, and we'll blank, 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 blank. Close that, and we'll close that thing out. Let's see if we did that on the fly. Boom. So you get the idea here. So now you can start to do some really, really cool stuff. So as you can loop through your multiple person columns or your multiple choice columns, um, you can do everything you could do normally, but you get this idea of a templated element. The one thing to note is that you cannot use the for each and the root elements up here, which makes sense when you think about it. You have to have a container for all these elements you're creating. So you can't do that until you get to at least one child down. But the nice thing is you can do this even further. So let's take a little, a little further than this, okay? Let's go over here to our classic Warrior Horses site. Now, recently we all know that the uh, Warrior Horses went corporate. But even further, we've got several corporate initiatives, right? So one of those is more inclusivity. Is that a word? Inclusivity. I can't say that word. But uh, go with it. All right, so each horse is valuable, and they want to make sure they provide more visibility um, to each of their individual horse slaves, right? So if we go here, we've got our classic uh, things. All right, we've got this assigned to. Now, that's okay, and right, we, saw, we showed how we can work with that text before, right, when you got the join. But what if we did something like... You know, come back up here to our uh, SP dev list formatting, right? And we've got the, uh, you know, some of these samples. And we come down here, we have this cool one, uh, the person round image format, right? So this allows you to show a person with that cool little profile image. So we're just going to grab that. But this is designed to work with a single column, right, or a single choice, person field. Uh, there we go. All right, so I'm going to format this guy. Ooh, that's a big. Okay, we'll paste that in, and you'll notice that uh, that's a little screwy, right? So we got rid of the fact that we had multiple selected. It's really only able to act on that first one, and then even then, not so successfully. Now, using what we just did, we can easily convert that. All right, so we can come in here, and we can add that for each. So we can take that previous template. We can add a for each on it. Just a couple there. I'm going to say person iterator. Again, that, that is made up by me. But I will tell you, if you use something like title, you'll never have access to the title field from then at that point forward. So just make sure you don't clobber it. Okay? I will add a nice uh, margin here so that they don't all stick together. All right. Oh, so two pixels. That sounds fancy. All right. And then the only thing we need to do is down here where we're referencing our fields, we can again replace that. Let's go copy that. So I have to type for the person iterator. All right. So now we can just come in here and we can say, just like we would any other field. I'm going to grab that email, grab that title. So now we do something like that and we preview it. Boom! Now we start to get all sorts of different people. So this is really, really cool. But you'll notice we've got some issues here where anytime we get over three people, we start to get weird shrinkage. Nobody likes weird shrinkage. You quote me on that. All right? So we want to do something a little more elaborate. And the only way you can really do that um, is to know some things about where we are inside that loop, you know, and make some adjustments on that. So we want to do something very similar to the UI Fabric face file, right? So we've got this thing where we want to show a couple people, and when it starts to not look good anymore, right, we want to show this kind of uh, descriptive overflow button where we show how many other people were in there, right? So how can we do that? Well, the only real way to do that, um, okay, I need to turn off my notifications. <laughs> All right. Uh, so the only way we can really do that is to start using something called loop index. I'm just going to go ahead and copy that one here. So we've got some samples. Uh, let's see. So if we come back to our column samples, uh, that one from before I just showed you, the multi-choice uh, for each, is there with those letters. So it's a pretty simple or not simple. It's just a straightforward version of the for each. We also have this new one here, which is the multi-person face pile. So if I come in here and I grab this, I'm just going to grab it, and then we'll go through what it's doing. I feel like you guys aren't actually having a conversation. You're just messing with me. Okay. Paste that. Preview that. Ooh, fancy. So what's actually happening there, right? How did we accomplish that? Well, that's where we get this cool new guy called Loop Index. 
So we come in here and we can say our display all right, is if the loop index on the person iterator is greater than or equal three. So what does that mean? So the loop index is a zero-based index of where you are inside your for each loop. Outside of a for each loop, it uh, means nothing. But when you do that, you can specify through a string whatever iterator name you chose. So whatever your virtual field name is, put that here. Don't use the uh, you know all this stuff to get that, but you just put it in here. The reason you have to specify that is because you can nest all of these for each loops. Okay, so we put this. So all we're doing is saying, hey, if you've got more than than three of these, stop showing, right? All right. And then we come down here and we say, hey, to our standard image element, we're doing a quick check to say, hey, if you've got more, we're using the length function, which says how many actually selected items we have. So how many people we have. We take a look at that. We say, if you've got more than three of those, you know, don't display this if you're not on the third one. I know you review this logic later, but the idea here is we want to show it normally if there's three or less. And if there's more than three, we want to show this kind of extra element. So we've got this extra element we've stuck in here that's not a part of our for each loop, right? So the for each loop, I just call it for each loop, but on the for each loop, dang it, my gosh, I'm so distracted by these notifications. Okay, so we got this cool thing here where we're just checking to say, hey, if you've got more than three and you're on the third one because it's zero-based index, uh, then show it. Otherwise, uh, hide this little thing here. So that's all we're doing. So the cool thing is now we can start to do stuff where, we can apply these complex objects, right? And again, we can nest these. We can have multiple children, and we can reference their values all throughout it. We can also tell where we are. So if we wanted to tell where the last one was, we could do all that. And so it's pretty, really, it's really powerful stuff. So if you haven't checked out the for each loop, which of course you haven't because it's brand new, now you can. All right. Uh, one last thing to note is uh, down here, I'm doing something where I'm just determining what that number is. Bug here, where when you go to minus. Uh, a number from a complex field, you'll need to wrap it in parentheses. If you're interested, uh, there's an issue, and you can follow along on all that. All right. Uh, what do we got? Let's go back here. So to review the 4-H, this is it. Do not add it to the root element. It will not work. You'll get an error. You will cry. All right, but it will turn your element into a template, and it's repeated for each item in the array. If you don't want it repeated for each item in the array, say like we did with the people, you can use that loop index uh, determine where you are on the array and cancel some of that stuff based on the values, either of the fields or other fields, or based on the actual position in the loop it is. All right. And again, creates the virtual field. You can nest these. And for loop index, it's zero based. It is the position. And uh, you make sure this is the weird one, right? So don't forget your single quotes around your iterator name. If you forget those, you might be kind of sad. All right. And moving on here. There's your resources. So check out the full documentation there. There's two new samples that both handle the for each. There's the multi-choice for each and the multi-person face pile. I've shown you both as column samples, but these can be used within view formatting as well. So you can use those with that row formatter element, no problem. And if you're looking for a little more detail, you can check out this link here, and this will take you to a full write-up of everything we talked about in the blog. I don't know if that's a link. That's it. That's all I got today. Excellent. Thank you, Chris. Uh, awesome stuff, as always. Uh, so let me actually move in to back on the slides because we continue from there. Uh, quite a lot of people actually participating on the, on the discussion on the window as well. So really good. Really, really cool stuff. And good to get that one recorded as well. And like you've seen, Chris always provides the samples, and the samples are available. There was a question related on, is this available out of the box in uh, SharePoint Online? Answer is yes. The column formatting and view formatting is on SharePoint Online in modern lists and libraries, and those are getting rendered properly also in list web parts. And if you embed any of the SharePoint pages, SharePoint lists uh, directly in Teams, uh, everything is included in the Teams rendering as well. So um, that's absolutely available. Cool. Um, but next uh, on the list of things, uh, we talk about, uh, well, we move on to the demo and slash topics section. And Paolo is going to talk about the technical design and architecture of SharePoint provisioning service uh, for the sample portal demos. Uh, that's, well, uh, for the provisioning service. And we'll, and then after that, Velin is going to talk about SPFX unit tests and code coverage, uh, quality gates in Azure. But let's actually go in here. And uh, Paolo, I think you're looking into doing a few slides, right? Right, and uh, not actual demos. Was, was that the intention? 
Uh, well, a few slides and maybe a demo, an overview of the provisioning service by itself, uh, and then we'll see. Uh, so let me let me share my screen, if you don't mind, where I still have the slide deck so that I can yep. easily switch to uh, the browser as well. So give me Absolutely. a sec to, to share my screen and let me know when you see it, please. So now, uh, in the meantime, while we are waiting for the uh, slide deck to show up, uh, and maybe you see it now, maybe not. not uh, loading, loading, loading. Okay. That's great. <coughs> so, the provisioning service, the SharePoint provisioning service uh, is. And we got it. We got it. Okay, cool. Uh, so the SharePoint provisioning service is a relatively new service that we uh, released a few weeks ago, I think uh, mid-March, if I'm not mistaken, uh, through which uh, you can uh, uh, provision uh, uh, solutions based on provisioning templates uh, on your own tenant uh, really easily, just going to a website, uh, selecting the uh, template that you want to uh, apply on your target tenant, uh, providing uh, uh, the uh, admin consent uh, if uh, uh, you want to have our service to being able to provision stuff on your tenant, uh, and then uh, you will find a uh, uh, new site uh, uh, or new sites uh, created on your environment with uh, custom templates applied on top of them uh, in order to be able to reproduce the lookbook uh, uh, solutions that we have uh, in SharePoint Online, uh, as well as, generally speaking, uh, being able to have a demo environment uh, in a matter of few minutes uh, in order to show the uh, uh, potential and the capabilities of SharePoint Online and the modern UI to your customers or to your users uh, uh, through uh, real uh, solutions deployed in your tenant. Under the cover of this service, there is the uh, PMP provisioning engine. And so let me show you briefly a, a walkthrough uh, of the uh, SharePoint Online provisioning service, and then I will explain you the architecture which is under the cover of the solution. This is the website. And as you can see here, you can browse through all of the available uh, templates. You can uh, pick up uh, whatever template you like, and you can see what are the main features and capabilities of every template, including, and you should uh, really read them, the prerequisites, which will give you some information about what is required to being able to provision uh, the uh, template on your tenant. For example, this one is a pretty simple one, but there are some templates which require, for example, uh, to have your user with uh, a, a, an admin account uh, in the uh, taxonomy service, or for some of the uh, templates, uh, we need to have uh, an already existing app catalog in your tenant, uh, and you need uh, to take care of those prerequisites, otherwise the provisioning will not happen, of course, because uh, uh, the prerequisite will not be satisfied. And if you want to apply uh, any of the templates that we have uh, uh, available in the service, you just need to click on the Add to your tenant button. As you can see here, we highlight the required permissions to uh, apply this template. Right now, we have uh, just and only templates which require tenant admin permissions, but we are working on making it possible to provision these templates uh, just with site collection admin uh, um, rights, which can be a, a nice improvement to uh, allow people to to uh, test uh, stuff uh, without the need to being tenant admins. And once you click on the Add to your tenant, uh, you will be prompted with a uh, form which you can use to configure the uh, very basic settings for provision in the template, like, for example, an email address that you want to use uh, to get notified when the provisioning will be completed, uh, the title that you will have for the site that will be created, uh, and actually, if the site uh, uh, will be created, this will be the URL of the site, and in order to be sure that we don't overwrite anything that you already have, we validate that URL. If the site is already existing, you have two choices. You can select to override the existing site or update the existing site with the template, or you can just cancel and provide a different uh, URL. Most likely, this one will be available. Let's see. You can select a custom uh, graphical theme uh, for your template if you like. As you can see, I made quite a bit of testing on this tenant, so I have just a couple of uh, themes available. But you can select a custom theme and apply that one to the target site that will be created. Once you are done, you click the provision button. You get a recap of what will happen, uh, what we will do with the provisioning service targeting your tenant. And by clicking the confirm button, the provisioning process uh, will start. 
under the cover, there will be the PMP provisioning engine, which will do the magic, will do the provisioning of all the stuff uh, in your tenant. It can be the provisioning of a single site. It can be the provisioning of a hierarchy of sites, for example, in a site hub, if you want, uh, based on the template that you will pick up. Uh, just to be clear, all of the templates that we use uh, in the provisioning service are stored in a GitHub repo, which is public and available on the network. This is the URL, github.com SharePoint SP Dev Provisioning Templates. And here you can find uh, all the tenant uh, level templates, which are those that require tenant admin permissions. For example, the drone landing is the one I picked up before, if I'm not mistaken. And here it is. And here you can see what is the .pmp file. You can even see the source code of the uh, .pmp file, and you can just download it and use it in your own environment if you don't want to use the website, uh, but you simply want to get the template and use it wherever you want. So, uh, let me go uh, briefly back to the slide deck to explain you what's under the cover of this service. So, first of all, as I said, uh, it's a service, it's a kind of PMP provisioning engine as a service, let me call it this way. And through the website, you can select the templates by category. Right now, we have samples and solutions. And once you have done that, uh, the very first time, you will have to log in with your tenant and grant the permissions to the application, which represents at the Azure Active Directory level the solution. Once you have done that, uh, you will be able to schedule the provisioning of your template. Uh, as I said, which can be a single site or a hierarchy of sites. Under the cover, we have quite a complex uh, scenario, quite a complex solution based on a bunch of Azure services. Uh, and I think this is a, a clear uh, example of how you can uh, leverage the powerful capabilities provided by Microsoft Azure. Uh, this is the whole list of services that we use. I don't want to uh, read all of them, but as you can see, there are quite a, a lot of them. And this solution will be open sourced soon or soonish, <laughs> as soon as we will be ready to do that. But stay tuned, uh, you will have the source code of the solution, which is a Azure Active Directory multi-tenant solution. From an architectural perspective, what happens or what we have under the cover is, first of all, the website, the provisioning.sharepointpmp.com website. You log in, and we use Azure Active Directory to authenticate your user and to get uh, through the Open Authorization 2.0 flow all the uh, uh, required information to act uh, on your behalf, so an access token and a refresh token. We use the Azure Key Vault to store in a safe and secure way uh, uh, those information so that when you request to provision a site, we store in the storage queue of Azure a message which will pick up uh, from, a, a from a job or from a function, and within the job or function, we can read from the key vault uh, the tokens that we need to uh, act uh, on your behalf, and we can uh, get eventually, if needed, a, even a fresh new access token using a refresh token stored in the Azure key vault, uh, so that we can use those tokens to talk with the micrograph, with the SharePoint Online REST APIs, and with all of the APIs that we need to talk with. And by doing that, we can create the site, we can provision the artifacts, we can do all we need to do in order to uh, get ready and to uh, release, to provision uh, the template onto your tenant. Once the job uh, is completed, we get rid of the tokens so that we don't keep any uh, sensitive information in our side, and we simply get rid of them, uh, removing them from the Azure Key Vault. Uh, from a, a sharing perspective, I want to share with you uh, the challenges or the key topics uh, of the architecture of the solution. First of all, we had uh, to make a solution which is highly available because there are quite a lot of people using this service nowadays, and we are pretty happy of that. We are really happy of that, actually. And uh, we are using the well-known asynchronous pattern that we promote as PMP that we have been promoting since a while ago. We also use a bunch of Azure services, which, of course, uh, makes our life easier in having an highly available solution. From a security perspective, what we do in the architecture of our solution has been reviewed by the Microsoft Identity Platform, and there is an ongoing update 
coming out, which will use MSAL 3.0, uh, together with a custom token cache, which will store the tokens in the Azure Key Vault. Right now, we do something different, but uh, now that we have MSAL 3.0, we are going to upgrade uh, the service toward uh, MSAL uh, 3. Uh, from a high-level permission uh, uh, demand uh, that we uh, need to satisfy in order to be able to provision the stuff, uh, if you don't want to grant those high-level permissions, tenant-level admin permissions to our application, well, you can always download the packages and the solutions from the GitHub repo, and you can apply them with the classic approach using PowerShell or PMP site score. And one challenge that we faced and that we had to keep into account is, of course, throttling, because with a multi-tenant solution, which is used by quite a lot of users on a daily basis, we need to take care of not being throttled by all of the services that we interact with. So those are the main key points of interest and challenges that we faced and that we solved with the architecture that I shared right now with you. And I think that's it on my side. If you don't have any specific uh, feedback or question, Beza, coming from the chat area. No, no, so nothing really major on the chat area. Velin, let's actually move into our screen. But while we're doing that, thank you, Paula, uh, on this okay. one. Just um, So for me, Gautam is asking, is it GDPR compliant? Answer is yes, we're not storing anything. So there is no information stored about uh, anybody about the, uh, the person. So answer is yes. Um, and that's, one of, by the way, one of the reasons why we don't actually store any information. So there's no need then for GDPR uh, challenges. Now, um, on Johanna's comments, super interesting, thanks. Uh, so like I said, uh, we will start uh, that's meant to be open sourced uh, as fast as possible as a reference implementation on how to build multi-tenant applications which can then access uh, multiple uh, multiple uh, tenants. So um, we are still working on the open source uh, permissions, and that's a legal thing, uh, but that should be uh, happening sooner or later. Uh, Velin, just double checking. Yep. Can you start sharing your screen? Cool. Cool. But yeah, so the, the service is coming as an open source solution uh, uh, sooner or later, um, and that's now pending for our internal Microsoft legal uh, approvals. I need to go through some bureaucracy related on that one. Um, if there's any other questions related on the service itself and the architecture which has been used, uh, just let's use the iron window. Now I can, by the way, well and say that it's starting, so we don't miss, miss the whole demo. Um, Quickly, still on the provisioning service, uh, I will later today actually release a 4.5, 4.3, 4 4.5 minute video, which will basically walk through uh, the process uh, in as fast as possible related on, hey, here's a lookbook site. I want to have this lookbook site uh, provisioned to my tenant. And really the key point of that one is to make it really easy for anybody to provision cool looking modern SharePoint sites. So you can actually do multiple requests of multiple templates at the same time against your tenant, and after a few minutes, uh, you will have a nice set of uh, sites available which you can learn to use the modern SharePoint experiences. They have example content, documents, pages, and all of that. So it should be quite useful for everybody. Now, Velin, we can see your screen. Uh, okay. So let's actually move forward with that one. So take it away. Thank you. Yep, thank you. So hello, my name is Velin. I'm a SharePoint developer for a very long time. Um, today we'll talk about another topic related to DevOps pipelines. So I'll be your, your DevOps guy again. And this is uh, about putting uh, quality gates on your uh, uh, DevOps pipelines, DevOps automated pipelines. And I'll, I'll just talk what is a quality gate in a minute. But this is a follow-up on previous four demos. So you can find those previous four demos on those URLs and build on top of that we'll add additional knowledge. So there might be terms that if you're not familiar, just go back to those URLs and try to catch up with those basics, like one and two are like basics on Azure DevOps pipelines. Um, so today is quality gates. Why quality gates and what is quality gate? So in the DevOps pipeline, when you do continuous integration, you usually grab the, uh, grab your code from the source control, uh, build it, package it, and move it to a tenant, and this is your deployment. Why you would care about quality gates? Because it's part of the CLI pipeline. Like, 
this is more to prevent uh, uh, unhealthy code to go through production. So you have uh, different quality gates just to keep your solution healthy, your features healthy, and uh, uh, try to prevent as much as you can uh, uh, bad code going through the pipeline into production. So uh, there are some nice reasons on the Azure DevOps side here, scenarios for gates, incident management, blah, 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 quality validation. But basically for me is a developer can, uh, without knowing the code, can ruin the code or can ruin a feature, and that feature might slip through uh, the production. And uh, that, like me, I, I usually break my team's code uh, and, you know, then, then we have uh, more critical issues. So... Um, going further is, like, you can go there, I can share that URL, and you can see all the different scenarios for quality gates. But a gate basically is things that will stop that code going to production. And two quality gates could be unit tests as one quality gate. If your solution has unit tests, and if unit test fails, that means something's wrong, and you won't pass that quality gate. And another is code coverage which is, again, if you don't meet a, a certain threshold, uh, the build will fail and uh, someone has to fix it. Like, how we can do that with the SharePoint framework um, is I have a build here already. So let me see my build. And uh, I already have definition prepared for you. And today I'll be using the gist because we already had a few samples done in Jest, and it's easy to configure, and we know how to do it, and we can easily embed it as part of our pipeline. I'll show you a few URLs here, because I want, uh, again, this is not a basics, and how to set up Jest, uh, like myself, and Paolo, and Andrew Colno, all, all have good, uh, good content on that, and I'll just try to paste that into the chat, so you have all these URLs, and, and can follow up on that. But uh, now here is a pa uh, part of my build process. I'm building the solution here, but after I build the solution using Gulp bundle ship, then I run unit tests. And if a unit test fails, you can see my test suits here. If unit test fails, that will fail at that step here, and it won't let me proceed to the next step. Also, you have all these... Uh, uh, th that's a report on coverage, and if you have a certain coverage thresholds, and if they're not met, uh, Jest will automatically exit with error, and that will fail the build again. So it's very easy if you're using Jest and put it as part of your pipeline to do coverage and tests at the same time with only one line of, of execution here. And uh, in general, when we build quality gates, we first start with unit tests and, and coverage. So uh, that's why I started with that. Maybe in the next episode, we can talk about the different quality gates. But how this has been done, right? So I'll open my YAML file just to show you how it looks. Then I can try to break it just to show you how this, this might fail. Um, here is my code and my solution, and usually in the package JSON file you have all your JEST configurations. But the important piece for now, for, for now for us is how we control the coverage threshold. It is a nice uh, piece of JSON here that you can plug in into your package file under the JSON configuration, and you can set uh, some uh, uh, threshold in persons, and, and here you can see that my branches has to be covered by tests and 100%, my line statements, functions, everything has to be 100%. Everything below that will fail the build. And uh, then we have some unit tests here, and I'll just try to fail a unit test, I'll say 6, and I'll run the build kit. Uh, fail by purpose. Okay, so a unit test will fail. Let's imagine that uh, the, the unit test is supposed to be correct and my functionality is supposed to be broken. I don't have time to break my functionality, so I failed the test just to show you how this will work in the pipelines. But the build definition, again, as from the previous episodes, you have a virtual uh, machine where the, the, the build will run. That triggers whenever something goes to the master branch in GitHub. 
Then on that virtual machine, we install Node. We do npm install to bring all our, all our packages for the SharePoint framework solution. Then we do go bundle, and after that, we do npm test. When we do npm test, because my configuration is set up here like that, uh, let me just show you up. So when I do test from my solution, I will simply run the gist testing. And uh, it will run all the tests, the coverage, and after that, if everything is successful, it will, will, will package the solution and we'll make that solution available as artifacts uh, here. And then at the end, we can just create a nice little report that can be displayed. I will show you how this works. Uh, but basically, that's using another NPM package. So if you go here, you'll see that I'm using just JUnit, and that will generate, and this is a configuration, that will generate an XML file that Azure DevOps uh, pipelines can use and generate a nice report. Now, let's go to the build, uh, and there should be a build running with that build definition already. And we are at the stage of NPM install, but while we're waiting, uh, like my previous episode was about parallel tests. So you can run that in a sequence, as, I, uh, as you had that uh, definition here. But you can run that in a parallel because, no, no, no. So this is how we run it in a sequence. I already showed you that. But we can run that also in parallel because just doesn't care if the package is being bundled or um, not. And it runs independently. It compiles the, uh, the, the TypeScript. And here you can see that uh, uh, we can run it in multiple jobs in parallel. So we can build the solution in one, uh, in one job. And we can run the tests separately in, a, uh, in another job. So the, this is handy in case you have uh, like 10,000 tests and they run slowly and you don't want to wait. It's like more to, to um, save you some time. And the build is running. Actually, both of my builds are running. It's the parallel build is running. The other one uh, is actually paused. So we'll go just to the parallel to see what's happening. So yeah, so that job didn't succeed. And it didn't succeed because I failed the test. Like if we go to to that job here, you can see that the, the piece with uh, with just failed, and actually what it's saying is your tests failed. So that test failed because you expected a value of, shit, uh, of, of of six, but actually the value is four. And you can uh, like a developer can go and quickly fix that. But also what it failed, it failed the threshold because the threshold on coverage, because my coverage is not 100%. You can see that I don't have spe specific classes are not up to 100%. So here below it says threshold not met. <coughs> this will still throw an error. Even I, even that test succeeded, it would still fail because of the threshold. And this is how you can control it. Um, that's pretty much it. All the code is available as a sample uh, in the GitHub, in the SharePoint uh, repository. I think I've sent that as URLs. Uh, and um, you can try it and see if that works for you. That's that from my side, Bess. Awesome, awesome. Thank you, Velin. Thank you very much for that one. Uh, really, really useful stuff. And good to get this stuff also covered and recorded as a video guidance. Uh, and it, everything will be released, obviously, in the SharePoint Dev YouTube channel. So uh, you can access this information and the videos and recordings uh, in there. Um, I will jump back on the slides. And unfortunately, it did jump on the first slide. So let me actually jump to the right slide on the end. So now we're not going to, again, unfortunately, have too much time for Q&A. I did saw that there's an ongoing uh, discussion all the time in the IAM window, which typically is taking care of the maturity of the Q&A uh, sections. Now, um, the next time uh, we'll have the next SharePoint Dev special interest group call is on April 18th. Next week, we actually do have two different community calls. We didn't, I didn't cover the monthly community call here. So we will have a monthly community call uh, on Tuesday, 9th of April, where we have Andrew Connells presenting uh, SharePoint Framework, uh, sorry, building business applications for Microsoft Teams using SharePoint Framework and Microsoft Craft, and then we culture uh, the user, latest user voice status and all of that stuff and the contributors within the last month.
And then the next SharePoint Framework community call is on next Thursday. So same time, week from now, is the SharePoint Framework special interest group call with three different community demos as well. So Tuesday's call is the monthly community call, and we have much less content there. Uh, it's mainly only for an AC doing the demo, and then we should have some time for the Q&A and the discussions on these things as well. But that's it uh, from our side. So thank you very much for joining. Thank you, Paolo. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Velin, for great demos. Uh, the recording will be out in the SharePoint Dev YouTube channel within uh, 24 hours. Thank you, everybody.